Since February 3rd, coronavirus cases outside of Hubei province, the epicenter of the outbreak, have dropped, and thousands of infected patients are being discharged after recovery. As the nation battles the outbreak, travel in the province remains shut down. These are the extraordinary efforts being used to contain the virus. Dr. Huerta, uh, you used a word that I don't hear a lot of in describing China, but you used the word courage. You, you said that the country's shown courage in how they've handled this. Uh, describe why. When you have an epidemic that the virus is causing hundreds, um, thousands of cases, and then you have to contain that epidemic by closing, shutting down a whole city of 11 million people, that is courage. Once they announced it to the world, they were very resolute in taking actions, and that is important for a public health care system. A public health official, they need to be decided in their actions and say, I'm going to do this, and I'm going to do it. Of course, I may be able to change, you know what, but I will only change in front of evidence. And that's what they're doing. I'm very impressed by the way they are managing this. I'm very honest about that. I told my listeners on the radio shows about that, that uh, I think China has done an excellent job this time in containing this, uh, these epidemics to their territory and by doing so, protecting the rest of the world. What we don't know, and that's why the WHO, the World Health Organization, said that this is an international crisis, is what would happen if the virus go to a country with a very weak public health system. We don't know about that. That's a very huge unknown. This virus um, is able to be passed to 2.6 people. One sick person can give it to 2.6 people. What will happen in other countries? We don't know. Dr. Huerta is an expert on public health, author of the book, Health Made Easy, and a prominent figure on Spanish language radio in both the United States and Latin America. He also served as president of the American Cancer Society, where he focused on prevention. Dr. Huerta earned his master's degree in public health from Johns Hopkins University. And in the past, we've had SARS, we've had MERS, um, Ebola, we start to think about some of these things that frighten us. Are there lessons from them uh, applicable today, or is each one a different beast in a sense? I think all epidemics are the same. Of course, they change by knowing the enemy. The virus were completely different, completely different in their behavior, uh, but the basic tools to fight the epidemics are there. You know, data evaluation by surveillance, containment, and then try to make sure that patients are being treated, are being isolated, the quarantines, all that basic stuff that public health does, all those tools are there. It may change because of the virus is more aggressive, less aggressive, it changed because the virus is more respiratory than digestive or whatever. Those are the, the, the things that may change the approach. But the basic tools of public health, they need to be used all the time. As someone was pointing out, you're, you're talking about the population of Canada, you're looking at a major city like New York or Los Angeles. I, I find it mind-boggling if you were to try and do that here in the United States, that it would work. I mean, people would rebel against something like this in a sense. Well, remember that the world is a very diverse place. For example, if you go to Peru, my home country, you may not be able to do it either. If you go to maybe to some country in Africa or in, or in Asia, here in the United States, we have different ways of life, different ways of perceiving how we live together. Uh, China is a society that is able to do that. In, in my opinion, in public health, my public health perspective is very positive because when you are able to close a city, when you are, are able to analyze the data and say, okay, if I close this city, if I close that city, if I close this city, I'm gonna contain these epidemics, and you know what, I'm gonna do it. I know I'm gonna get a lot of push from inside or from outside, but public health is supporting my decision. And remember something else, Mike. This is very important. During the first couple of weeks of the epidemics, it was the Royal Imperial College in London. They did a study, a wonderful study, that they found out that because of the rate of uh, 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 contagiousness of this uh, virus and the number of new cases that were seen, the scientists, the epidemiologists, they said, 
this virus has jumped out very quickly from the intermediary host, the second animal, to the human beings because of the genome analysis. And they say, because that jump was so quick, means that this virus is able to maintain itself only by, uh, the con uh, by giving it to other people. In other words, by human transmission. And they calculate it. They say, if we are able to stop the contagiousness of this virus by 60%, the whole thing would go out. I think that, I have no proof, but I think that piece of information went to the public health authorities in China and they say, let's gonna get that 60%. Let's gonna make this virus 60% less able to go to another people, but doing this containment and we will control the epidemics. So far, it's working. Generally, you would think, okay, we ask these questions, we get these answers, now we have a solution. This one, it seems like it produces just as many questions as you go along. Are there surprises with this one? So science and epidemiology and public health, they are science, of course. They are dynamic, meaning that they change all the time. And this epidemics is new. We have never had this kind of virus in the planet Earth. So to be confronted for the first time ever with a virus like this is exactly what you're saying new things every single day. So we have to apply all the knowledge that we have so far, our experience with older epidemics, yes, but we don't know how this virus is going to behave. We don't know what's gonna happen in if, if, for example, it goes to a country with a public health system that is weak. We don't know, those are all unknowns. But so far, the fact that 99% of these cases are in one area, and all deaths, but one or two are in one area, means that the containment is working well. Yeah, I was just reading one article. It says global health experts are divided uh, on a number of these issues. And they say saying knowing how it behaves allows you to develop counter strategies. So I guess as you kind of move along in this process, at some point, you formulate the information that gets you those counter strategies, but right now everyone's still kind of groping around, correct? Well, that information that you need is called surveillance. And the surveillance is extremely important. You know, having all the hospitals connected through the internet. How many cases are you getting? The cases you are getting are changing. If we had more pneumonias in the past and less pneumonias now, are the pneumonias more in one lung than the other one? All this kind of information that's called active surveillance. And somebody is doing it, I'm pretty sure, that is observing. Okay, look at this virus. At the beginning, it was causing diarrhea. Now there's not much diarrhea. There's much, much more lung disease now and things like that. Those kind of information, pieces of information are the pieces of information that allow these scientists to say the behavior of this virus goes in this direction or in that direction. And because it's new science, of course, it cannot be full agreement. Some scientists are gonna think this way and other ones are gonna think the other way. That's the nature of science. Some people have actually been cured. They've walked out of the hospital, they're feeling fine, they had the pneumonia, and, and doctors are suspecting that there's neutralizing antibodies perhaps in their plasma, and now they're asking, well, maybe we can take their plasma and use it. This is kind of the, it, it's kind of groping around and trying to find solutions, isn't it? Uh, and, and that may be the pathway, correct? Could be, exactly, and that's when research questions start coming out, and programs or trials to respond to those questions are gonna come out and that's how we're gonna have uh, outcomes. We're gonna have solutions for this problem. But for example, no, another question is, why is it that there are no kids being attacked by this virus? Right. Very few kids, why? If you remember, if you read, probably you read, uh, Mike, I'm sure, the pandemics of 1918 that killed almost 90 million people in the world in 1918 to 19 during the First World War. The target of that virus, it was a flu virus, were people between 16 and 30, young people, 16 to 30. Why is that this virus is more older people and no kids? We don't have answer to that. And we have to remember that viruses, they are so amazing. Viruses are not living beings. 
Virus are pieces of chemicals, proteins, nucleic acids, you know, they are surrounded by capsules. That's what viruses are. I compare them with a piece of candy. If you have a piece of candy on top of your desk, that's a virus. Why? Because that piece of candy is, doesn't have any life. When does that piece of candy have any quote marks life? When you put it in your mouth and you say, mm, delicious candy. Otherwise, the candy is going to be like a piece of rock or something. Compare that piece of candy, for example, with a cat. The cat is a living being. It's an animal. That's the same difference between a virus, which is a piece of chemical, and a bacteria. Bacteria are beings that they respond to antibiotics. Viruses, they do not respond to antibiotics and only leave, quote marks, when they go inside the body, they take the immune system, take your cells, they divide and cause disease. The spike in numbers, I mean, we keep seeing these numbers and, and it seems like they're jumping like crazy. Is part of that a product of the fact that at the beginning of this, doctors don't know what they're dealing with? They think, well, maybe they just have pneumonia or they've got the flu or whatever. And now doctors knew, do know. People present, they're like, oh, I think this might be the coronavirus. I'm going to test for it. Is, it part, is that part of it or is it just that it's spreading so quickly? At the beginning, these cases of pneumonia were there. Okay. Once they found out it was an outbreak, and once they found out it was a virus test to find out this COVID-19, that's when the diagnosis starts. And that's when people started getting panicked. That's when people started for a little cough, go to the hospital and be diagnosed, and the cases just um, add up, add up. That's why in these epidemics, it's so important to always do the math and find out the proportion of people who die to the total number of cases. So far, for the last three or four weeks, it's 2.1, 2.2, 2 2.3%. That is the lethality rate, and that is very constant. That's an extremely important piece of information, which may go down, because if more cases are found in the community, then the first number is gonna be larger, and the number of deaths is gonna be less proportion. So, much less than 2.3. That's what we would like to do, to, to have. Worst case scenario and best case scenario as you look at it today? Best case scenario is that this dies out a little bit, little, little by little, little by little, and then we go from the 50,000 cases to 40, 30, and then the virus goes to another country because it's going to go to another country, and then goes there and circulates like the flu virus. Goes here and there, we can have, you know, this COVID, and 19 viruses here and there, but no epidemics at all. That's the best case scenario. The worst case scenario is that this virus goes to, for example, a very populated country, it could be India, it could be Nigeria, for example, and then causes a epidemic like this one, an epidemic like this one. That would be something that would be the worst case scenario because maybe those countries are not prepared to contain and the epidemic just explodes. So we don't know that yet, but that would be the worst case scenario. My impression, my impression, my gut feeling is that it's going to die out a little by little, and this virus is going to go to all over the world, but it's not caused an epidemic like this one. It's gonna be present, causing diseases, causing deaths here and there, but not as an explosion as we have it now in China. And why is that is happening this in China, we don't know. We exactly don't know, because we have cases here in the U.S. We have 13 cases confirmed. Why those cases were not able to go to the community? Why? Some of these people were in the community for two or three days. Had this virus been really that virus, my God, that's enough for one or two, three people to have maybe a outbreak of 30 cases, 10 cases, nine. We didn't have any. So we don't know yet that yet.